I'm only on verse 14. In Colossians 1, it says, For in the Son all our sins are canceled, and we have the release of redemption. And I put in there, from Egypt. You've been redeemed from slavery. You were bound by the sin of Egypt, but now you've been released. So you have the release of redemption through his very blood. Can you see how that's the Red Sea? Isn't that a beautiful comparison of Jesus' blood with the Red Sea? I mean, why did it have to be a Red Sea? Because it was representing the blood of Jesus. That's how you come out. He came and died for you, and it's through that blood. You're not coming through that empty sea anymore. You're coming through that blood to know the Father, to know the Father, not an angry God, the Father. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. I think we minimize that a little bit. He didn't say no man comes to God. No man comes to the Father. It's that relationship of Father to Son, and the Son has the authority of the Father. So when the Son sets you free, you're free indeed, not like a servant. And then verse 22. I love this one. He says he, he released his supernatural peace to Peter Roselli. Put your name in there. You can do that with the Bible. You know that, right? This is a personalized love letter from God to you. He released his supernatural peace to Peter Roselli through the sacrifice of his own body and the, as the sin payment on Peter's behalf so I could dwell in his presence. And you start confessing this out loud and you make this a part of your prayer time, you, the, the lies just don't stick anymore because you just keep reminding yourself who you are in Christ. And I'm a son. And just keep picturing that little boy hugging his dad. I'm a son. You can't even slip a piece of paper in here to lie to me, Satan, because this sand is making it like glue between us. I'm safe in the arms of my father. This is what he did for me. Right, you've heard that line that if there was only one human being on the planet, Jesus still would have came and gave his life for that one person. Every life is equally valuable. You're saying amen now, but wait till we get to bitter root judgments. <laughs> You're going to be like sinking in your seat because, you know, we believe that every life is valuable, but we don't treat people like we believe every life is valuable. <laughs> Guilty. Not intentionally, really, not intentionally. But it's so easy to form an opinion, to jump to a conclusion before you've had a chance to speak to the person or know what their life is like and what they've gone through to get here. I go to New York City and I see people walking that look like they probably should have even made it out of the house. And they're walking around on their walker and they might be going this slow. But they weren't going to stay home. You know, and I'm like, you're a hero, man. You're a hero because the easy way out would just be to bail on the whole thing and just give up. And like, no, I'm going. You're not stopping me. And that's the kind of mindset that we need. You know, the bunny, Energizer bunny, you keep going. That, that thing that hits the wall and bounces and keeps on going and keep, it keeps finding a way. The, the enemy doesn't want you there. The enemy wants you depressed. And under the covers, staying in bed all day. No way. No way. He released his supernatural peace to me through the sacrifice of his own body as a sin payment on my behalf so I would dwell in his presence. His presence is with me all the time because he loves me. Why does he want to be with me? Because he loves me. Even if people don't, he does. And now there is nothing between you and the Father God. For he sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. Some of you don't believe that. I'm telling you, I know it. Some of you don't believe it. This is the word of God. It's true. He sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. So the next time your spouse says something negative about you, say, well, God sees me as holy, flawless, and restored. So take that. That's right in the Bible. Well, that passion translation, man. I don't know if I like that passion translation. That's because you need a little more passion. <laughs> I mean, like, this is not a, a new thought, what I'm about to say, but just meditate on this for a minute. I'd say a majority of the people that you meet haven't had an encouraging word from an authority figure in years. 
Most people, not everybody, because there are people that have had great relationships with authority figures. But, but here's the deal. What I have found in life is that it's harder to do that. It's hard to encourage people, and it's much easier to put a guilt trip on them. It's much easier to rule with fear than to rule with love. And if the society accepts that, they won't say they accept it. But you can tell by their silence that they accept it. And that on the job especially, right? Like, anybody heard that one? You don't like the job? There's 10 other people waiting for this one. So you don't like it? Leave. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And, and in Wall Street, that's true. There are more than 10 people waiting for your job. And some of them work in your company. So if they can make you look bad, oh, yeah. That's their God is to keep going after mammon. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's never enough, by the way. No matter how high you climb up the ladder, you still have another one to go. I mean, if that's not the devil, what is? You don't ever get there. There's no there. I had a guy, he said, I love my boat until a bigger boat came by. <laughs> and then I hated my boat. <laughs> like, doesn't that sum up the devil? He keeps teasing you with things, making you think you're going to be happy, and then you're not. So then you get it, and then you need more of whatever that thing is. Fill in the gap. He's a liar. But the Lord sees me as holy, flawless, and restored. You need to look at the person that's who say, The Lord sees me as holy, flawless, and restored. So you should too. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I don't know that you will do what I'm about to say, but if you did, if you ever went back and looked at why Christianity became as popular as it did, and it still is the most popular form of worship on the planet, there's more people that are Christians than Muslims or anything else, okay? Still today, in spite of the decline of the Catholic Church and all that, there's been a charismatic renewal all over the world. Um, who did we hear say it recently? There's a billion... Uh, evangelical Pentecostal. I think it was Chayon, right? And he said 800 million of the billion are now charismatic Pentecostals. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, you could talk to him if you're not sure, but, you know, this is all just since 1906. That's not a long time to get 800 million people converted to charismatic Christianity. But why did it become popular? Because it really stood no chance. In the natural, when you looked at it, this was a poor, what they would have said is a poor Jewish carpenter who wasn't even educated, who only lasted for three years in ministry, and the Romans crucified him. So who would serve a crucified God? And remember what he said, it's good that I go, because if I go, who could come? The comforter. So that was the missing ingredient that they didn't see in the Roman Empire, is that by killing Jesus, it's going to spread his presence into anybody who would receive him. And now they'll be filled with his presence. And just like he was willing to die, they're going to be willing to die. And it only took 400 years, and Christianity was the, the Roman Empire's religion. Impossible. So historians that aren't believers keep looking at this like, how the heck did this happen? Because they don't get the Holy Spirit part, see? They can't understand that. And here's the thing. If you remember the movie by, uh, that was around the book, uh, the guy that we saw, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. Case for Christ, Lee Strobel. He was a lawyer working for a newspaper. His wife got saved at Bill Hybels Church in Chicago, and this guy was flipping out. He was not happy. He was an atheist. He was not happy that his wife became a Christian. There was a Christian on his job, so he walks up to this guy, and he said, my wife joined your cult. <laughs> I want you to help me tell her how to get out of it. <laughs> now, how much... You know, patience would that guy need? Like, who are you calling it a cult? This is the most important thing in my life, and you're calling it a cult? But he had the presence of mind and the presence of Holy Spirit in his life. I doubt he was expecting that question that day. But yet, this is what he said. At least the Lee Strobel said that that scene was accurate of the way it happened, because we got to talk to him at this event that we were at. And he said, here's what you do. It's easy. You want to disprove Christianity? Just disprove the resurrection, and you'll win. Would you have known to say that? But now you do. <laughs> See? You learned something. You get a bagel, coffee, and that little, that little hint. Are we having fellowship today? Oh, good. 
Saved by the bell. <laughs> like, dwell on that. The resurrection is the key to the whole thing. They saw him. 500 people saw him. So it's much more likely that they were willing to die when they saw the resurrected Christ because they knew no matter what, we win because we're going to be resurrected too. Some of them were going into the Colosseum knowing they were going to be eaten by lions singing worship songs. It's true. It's in church history. See, it's the mindset. And here we are. We complain over little things. They had their life on the line. But I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. But when you really read it and you understand what they had to go through compared to what we have to go through, it's amazing that they laid the groundwork for us like that. Amen. So that's what he's saying. The behavior which marked, this is commentary again, which marked out so much of the world at their time, first century Palestine, right? Roman Empire. The behavior was what? Lust, anger, lies. Think that's still happening? Yeah. Has anything changed? No. So the behavior that marked out their day still marks out our day. And it split up the community and the families, but it was replaced in the Christians by kindness and gentleness and forgiveness and acceptance of one another as members of what? Oh, man, this is real basic, but it's hard to do, isn't it? Even like the, the people that clean the office at the end of the day where I was working, I think I told you this, but... I'll just say it again. Like, nobody knew her name. The guys I worked with, they would just walk right past her. They didn't know her name. Like, they didn't even treat her like a human being because they weren't even aware she was there. They walked right past her because there was no immediate benefit of knowing her. And that's wrong. See, that's what I'm saying. That's why that bitter root judgment piece is that you're judging people un unjustly. It's God. It could be an angel, the Bible says. So don't do it. Start by believing the best. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, in the Amplified, love believes the best. So what these people were doing, not anger and lies and lust, it was being replaced by kindness and gentleness and forgiveness. And the Roman Empire just melted because they didn't know how to deal with kindness and gentleness. They were used to the anger and the lust and killing everybody that disagreed with you, my forefathers. <laughs> oh, the gospel doesn't just produce a new religious experience. For those who might like such a thing, it brings about something much greater, nothing less than, a little louder, please, nothing less than new creation. You and I are new creations in Christ. Any man be in Christ, new creation. 